you might want to mark this day in your calendar because this will be a day that will live in infamy in America's annals uh, in the history books. You are witnessing um, America's democracy being not just tested, I have long said on these airwaves that I, I believe that there are many people in this country who are still fighting the Civil War and today underscores that sentiment. As I watch uh, the halls of Congress being pursued by anarchists and operatives, people who have been set loose to thwart democracy, I am reminded that this this country is very fragile and very young. So joining me right now, he is the head of the Africana Studies Department at the Great Howard University. He's also two-time male HBCU Professor of the Year. Let me welcome to the show the one and only Dr. Greg Carr. My dear friend, Professor Hannah, how are you? Uh, I don't know. How are we? <laughs> Let me throw it back at you. Well, I'm excited. Are you? Oh, okay. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It reminds me of, in fact, when uh, we had a white riot here in D.C. Uh, back during the so-called Red Summer of 1919, and W.E.B. Du Bois printed some letters from black folk in D.C. at the time in, in the next issue of the crisis. And one of them was from a, a black woman that said, you know, uh, seeing what is happening in the street as our people fight back gave me the thrill of a lifetime. As I read the words of our courageous people in the streets fighting, I, I, I Tears flowed down my face. I fell to my knees and I exclaimed, I thank God, I thank God. Sometimes you just have to land the boil in order for the healing to begin. And that's what we're seeing right now. Oh, okay. I didn't expect that, but that's the thing. That's the thing. I don't know what to expect. I just asked the questions. I just asked the questions. So uh, I believe this is the last battle possibly in the Civil War, or maybe not. It is one of the last battles. I feel like, you know, at the end of a thing, you know, a cornered dog is his most dangerous. And I feel like, you know, this cornered dog that's been in the White House uh, for the last three plus years, four years, um, has really shown America for what she is. Like you said, we're in COVID-1619 uh, because this is the, the birth of, of what this country was born out of, right? So this is who we are. So what do we do with this? What we're watching right now, the anarchy, and I don't see the tear gas at the level that I saw this summer when people were peacefully protesting the, the racial injustice in this country. I don't, I don't see the in mass uh, military uh, National Guard out there taking these people off of Congress's steps, which is illegal. You know, I don't see, I don't see the, you know, I don't see how they cleared out you know, Washington, that square, Black Lives Matter Boulevard, so that the president could hold the Bible upside down in front of a church. I don't see the um, the beat back. No, and we, and we probably won't uh, unless they don't have any choice. Um, again, I, I'm very encouraged by all of this uh, because it, it, it's dragging it out into the, the naked light of day. And, you know, the first person I heard talk about COVID-1619 is the incoming, one of the two incoming senators from the state of Georgia, Reverend Raphael Mornick. So, uh, who has said that he's not going to uh, quit his pulpit at Ebenezer, which means that, and you know, our memory serves me correctly, and I skipped over um, uh, negligently Floyd Flake, of course, who was in Congress from, uh, and a minister and a church minister, but I thought immediately about Adam Clayton Powell, who didn't give up his pulpit when he came to Congress from, uh, from New York. An Abyssinian, but this will be a U.S. senator who will be preaching on Sundays and perhaps give a window into what true uh, spiritual practice and religion and morality might look like in politics. And uh, so, so I think that is that added fuel to the fire of what we're seeing right now. Um, but when I say I'm encouraged, um, I'm not saying that anyone should be beaten out there. I'm not saying anybody should be tear gassed or beaten, but until law enforcement in this country uh, treats everybody like the people who we see on our television screens right now. What is being exposed again is, and what's really being created is the racial baseline for law enforcement, violent crowd control. Um, and that's not in the hands of Donald Trump in a couple of weeks. That's in the hands of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And if reports to, again, have, they have been confirmed, Merrick Garland, uh, who has always been kind of soft and deferential when it comes to law enforcement um, and defendants' rights. Uh, this is setting a baseline for how we go forward. Merrick Garland, who was the nominee for um, the Supreme Court, 
uh, who That's Barack right. Obama wanted to sit on the Supreme Court um, and who Mitch McConnell and them blocked. Uh, he has now been tapped to be the attorney general. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I don't really have any problem with that in the sense that, you know, and we talk about this a lot and you talk about it all the time. And again, thank you. Hats off. And listen, everybody, this is the importance of black media. I'm not talking about just, you know, the kind of, this is the critical importance of black media to have these conversations. Um, and as you talk about all the time, this is about organizing, this is about local and community power. Uh, certainly, where there are a trillion other people that I or you refer to have as attorney general, absolutely. But that is an appointed position that, uh, that can be forced to do some things. And so when we think about the fact that the Biden administration the Democratic Party had written off and wrote off the South. Uh, Chuck Schumer taking a victory lap today tickled me since he uh, ignored Georgia, like the rest of the Democratic establishment, same way they ignored Kentucky and Mississippi. Uh, if they had put resources in, or better yet, turned the resources over to the local organizers, shout out to all the sisters and the brothers who helped, but especially the sisters, not just Stacey Abrams and Latosha Brown, but so many others, including many young people who doc- knocked on literally millions of doors in rural Georgia, all over Atlanta and Savannah and Augusta. These are some of the young people, many of them young people, who flow into that state, who respond to phrases, defund the police, Mr. 44th President of the United States, who should now throw your mouth shut, because what you're witnessing is a local organizing-based movement that is driving folk into places that they might not normally otherwise go. So Merrick Garland, uh, who cares who the attorney general is as long as people continue this momentum of organizing? Now, you know, the citizens of Maine saw fit to return the concerned Susan Collins to the United States Senate. So what did the citizens of Georgia do? They took it upon themselves to retire Mitch McConnell. They took it upon themselves to switch out perhaps Bernie Sanders for Lindsey Graham as the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. They took it upon themselves, in other words, not to rescue America, but to act using the vote as an act of self-defense. And that's not an American uh, ideal. That's an ideal of people who have decided to do what we should always do with politics, which is use it as a weapon. Yeah, and what we're seeing today, if, I mean, if I'll just say this right quick, if, if, if folks have been watching from this morning, uh, when you saw them at the ellipse uh, outside the White House with Donald Trump Jr. and Vernon Jones switching to the Democratic Party, announcing his fealty, and then Donald Trump coming out and basically telling people to do what they're doing right now, then you knew that this was coming. I mean, Karen, didn't you, you talked about this when we talked about this a month ago, that this was going to be very likely to be what was happening. So, you know, I think going forward, what we'll probably see today, you know, Muriel Bowser, I got the alert just about, 20 minutes before I came on the air with you. Uh, Muriel Bowser has declared a 6 p.m. curfew here in D.C. But now what's going to have to happen is these folks are going to have to decide, the federal government, not just the Capitol Police, but ultimately the National Guard, they may have to call in some others. They're going to have to decide when enough is enough. And I think that's going to be a thing that we're all going to be in suspense to see how they make that decision. I want to play Mitch McConnell, and I want to ask you what his play is. Uh, Mitch McConnell gave an, an opening a statement after Alaska gave its four piddling uh, electoral college votes to Donald Trump. Arizona was next with their 11. They, it's 11. And somebody stood up and pro- I object to these votes going to Biden. Do you have it in writing? Yes. Do you have a senator sign off? Ted Cruz stands his raggedy ass up. And then they go, we have to have a conference about this. Two hours, they're going to debate. And then all hell broke loose, right? But while they're in the back room debating about these 11 votes, and now we're just at the A's. We haven't even got through. the. You know, this, they, they had set this up, you know. So this is what planning looks like, even if it's erroneous. I, I had to respect that they, they were ready for this. And Trump was telling us all along this was going to happen. And Pence pretended like he was going to be a, a righteous human being. And he, I don't know what God he serves. But anyway, Mitch McConnell stands up and gives this statement. Smith, play it. I support strong state-led voting reforms, last year's bizarre pandemic procedures must not become the new norm. But my colleagues, nothing before us proves illegality anywhere near 
the massive scale, the massive scale that would have tipped the entire election. Nor can public doubt alone justify a radical break when the doubt itself was incited without any evidence. The Constitution gives us here in Congress a limited role. We cannot simply declare ourselves a national board of elections on steroids. What the hell? I, I declared that these are the last days as a result of that speech. I don't know. This man literally orchestrated the dis, the, the, the dis, disagreement, the, dis, the, the all of the friction that we see right now was him talking about Obama being a one-term president, his obstructionist, his working with all of them. Now, now what, explain this, Dr. Carr. What, what is his game with his black heart and his black hands? <laughs> Well, white heart and white hands. Again, okay. I, I, yes, I think you're right. You you're right. Heart. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's no, I'm good with it. I'm, you know, I, I, you know, I, I respect Mitch McConnell. Um, anyone who has followed Mitch McConnell's career, and there was a book a couple of years ago, a little small book called The Cynic, which charts his his rise and his career, understands what Mitch McConnell did today. Mitch McConnell will say and do anything. So. You know, what we heard today is entirely consistent. Uh, as you said, when we saw them bring that, that those two mahogany, those mahogany boxes into the well of the legislature, leather lined boxes that contain the electoral vote, and Nancy Pelosi turned over the meeting to smiling Mike Pence, when we saw that, uh, they knew what was going to happen. Of the 13 senators and over 100, 100 Congress people, uh, who said that they would con- raise these objections. We knew that the first state was probably going to be Arizona. Ted Cruz had already said he would rise to co-sign the written objection. So when Paul Gozer got up two hours ago, a little bit over two hours ago, and, and objected to the county of Arizona ballots, they knew Cruz would come. Then applause broke out. Parenthetically, I don't know anyone. Who, I, saw, I know we would it will be comfortable in that damn chamber with all them people screaming. And it's like some of them want a super spreader, isn't it, by the way. But uh, we also know that other people, young Josh Hawley, uh, uh, like, I like to think of him as a, almost a white version of uh, the young Daniel Cameron in Kentucky, uh, the senator out of Missouri, um, he has said he will object to Pennsylvania. And uh, then we're going to see Kelly Loeffler in one of her last acts in the United States Senate says she's going to object to Georgia. So they've already got the co-signers lined up. We know they're going to be at least three times when we will see what we saw this morning, this afternoon, rather, which is, you make the objection, you get your senator, and then you've got to adjourn and go on two sides and debate. And so that's what they did. That's what they're going to do several more times. And now with this interruption, it may be into tomorrow afternoon, uh, you know, uh, when they finish. But, but McConnell, uh, he almost sounded like he wanted to cry. And not that I care one way or the other, but what the folks in Georgia did yesterday was retire the senator from Kentucky, the senior senator from Kentucky. By the way, Randy Paul is up. For re-election. And Randy is his birth name. He calls himself Rand. It's kind of cute. But Dr. Randy Paul is up for, uh, well, I guess he's not licensing wrong. He kept his license up. But Randy Paul is up for re-election in 2022. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means Mr. Schumer and Pelosi and the DNC and all that folks, you know, you might want to take a look at what Stacey Abramson did in Georgia since you didn't give a dime to Charles Booker in Kentucky and you wanted to run Amy McGrath. Understand what's happening now. From the bottom up, people have decided to tune out even the Democrats. And so in 2022, when somebody runs against uh, 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 Rand Paul in, in Kentucky, I suspect Chuck Schumer. Shout out Jamal Bowman and all these youngsters that are now in the United States Senate in that meeting right now. I suspect there's going to be a primary. So, uh, Chuck, get your mind right, bro. Because guess what? The reason that you can get up and take a victory lap today, the reason that uh, Mitch McConnell can try to retreat back into his tortoise cell and play the role with a little tear in his voice because he has been retired, is because people ignored your advice, ignored your chase these phantom white voter strategy, and instead they followed Stacey Abrams and Latosha Brown and all them sisters, and they even followed that cats like uh, uh, Tamika Mallory, and uh, you know who were down there knocking on doors, who were down there, and what did they say? Expand the electorate, bring these people in, explain it, get them to the polls. So I think what Schumer did today 
is uh, simply, uh, I'm sorry, what, 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 what McConnell did today was do what he's always done as the Senate. He throws the rock, and now, without the power, he's got to hide his hand. Because he already knows that his crew has already teed it up. And I suspect he already knew them people would come to the Capitol, too. But there's no way to prove it. How's this going to end? We're talking with Dr. Greg Carr in class with cars where you can find him as well as Africana Carr on the Twitters. How how do you uh see this ending if history is a is an indicator of of the of the of the future? Well, I don't know, sis. I don't know, Professor Hunter. I, I tell you this, the pages haven't been written, but it passed this prelude, we know this. Unlike the Civil War, when there were clearly two sides, there was the slave power that wanted to maintain itself, particularly in the South. There were its advocates in the federal legislature. The architect, in fact, of what we now call the filibuster, which, by the way, the Democrats should blow up. Chuck, no more sticky vote, man. you got to vote now. These people, what, what, what they did in Georgia. Simple majority. We need a simple majority. Right. That's right. you got a simple majority. Simple majority. The person that really pushed for what we now know as the filibuster uh, was a guy out of South Carolina named John C. who they call the intellectual architect of the country. It was Calhoun was attempting to protect the minority interest of the slave power in the South that said you have to have a supermajority to end debate and bring, bring something to the Senate. And so now, unlike then, there is no are you pro-slavery or, or against slavery. What you've got is the Democratic Party, I'm talking about the establishment of the Democratic Party, trying to hold on to this illusion of institutionalism. And you've got a white nationalist party that has taken over the Republican Party that is saying, damn all the rules, we want power by any means necessary. But the wild call that is swelling in numbers everywhere, because, it was, you know, as John King was poking and, and, and a man on MSNBC, Steve Karnacki, was poking at red, red counties and blue counties last night. I'm laughing because you see all those red counties in southwest Georgia. That's where Shirley Sherrod lived and Charles Sherrod lived. Meaning what? It was two or three more black people that voted. So you're pointing at counties instead of at people. And what is rising in this country? Is a group of people, not just black people, Latinos, Native Americans, a lot of Native Americans in Georgia, poor white people who are saying, you know what? Yeah, let me vote in my interest. Who's in my interest? And, and so what you're seeing is that's the wild card right now. And so I think we ask finally what we do go for, what's going to happen going forward. But Mary Garland can be the Attorney General. Guess what? You're Attorney General. So what's on your short list, bro? Criminal investigation of Trump, you're going to do it or not. Rebuild the Civil Rights Division, you're going to do it or not. FBI attacks on the FBI, you're going to do it. What about these domestic terrorists? Your first prosecution might be these people on the steps of the Capitol today. you got an agenda. And if you don't pursue the agenda that we want, we'll swap you out. And that puts the Vice President of the United States on the clock as well. It's, it's put up a shut up now. And that's an encouraging thing. We should be encouraged. We should be a little nervous, but it's okay. What we're seeing is a thing that, as you said, is dying. It's dying. And anytime something dies, there's a surge of adrenaline before it gives up the ghost. Yeah. What we're watching is something dying, and guess what? Something else being born. I love it. And as we watch uh, Washington implode uh, and be dismantled or be exposed for what she is and, and all of the violence that might come, I imagine a lot of those proud boys are armed. But as I said, pride comes before the fall. So these are the last gaps. Dr. Gray Carr is here, Africana Carr is where you can follow him on Twitter. And I think you should because he's dropping jewels. Um, before the break, uh, we, I, was, I was telling you when we were talking during the break about this, this 11th hour move that Trump, Trump made to, uh, I guess, uh, change the way Title VI is enforced, the Civil Rights Act of the Civil Rights Act. W what, what was that? Uh, is that another showing of his hand? Well, yeah, I think it was probably Bill Barr's last uh, middle finger to the country. Um, just his, it was the last one of the last acts Barr did. The Justice Department has sent to the White House without public comment, which is usually required, uh, approval for a change in how it enforces what's called Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, this change would prohibit people who get federal funding from discriminating based on race, color. Well, that's what Title VI does. But the regulation, uh, Title VI covers housing, employment, schools, hospitals. Um, think back to, the, in fact, you think back to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, that was an act that was uh, passed by Congress to basically enforce, to uphold the 14th Amendment. 
of the United States Constitution. And the disparate impact rule basically is the thing that says you don't have to prove that you as an individual were discriminated against in housing, mortgage lending, and, and you know, they, they put a, a language program in, in, in the schools and you don't have a language program in your school and you speak only Spanish and you were harmed individually or, uh, you know, you were subject to racial exclusion in the jury box and so you got the death penalty but there were no black people or no brown people on, on the jury. You don't have to prove in your specific case that it happened to you. you. If you demonstrate a pattern of this happening to a person in your group, women, LBGTQ over the years, black people, brown people, if you show a disparate impact so that the, the, the points you get on the interest rate on your mortgage, for example, uh, it seems like all black people get an elevated uh, mortgage rate, mm-hmm. then you can, the federal government can step in in your place and move to do everything from, say, for example, remember people remember in Chicago or Baltimore, the pattern and practice uh, uh, consent decrees that the Obama administration entered into when Eric Holder and then Loretta Lynch were the attorney generals in the wake of what happened in Ferguson and in Baltimore with Freddie Gray and others. These were backed by the idea that there's a pattern of discrimination. That's what they call disparate impact. What, what, what Bill Barr is doing with his middle finger as he scurried out the door trying to get ahead of this tsunami that was coming is ask the White House to scale back the, uh, the enforcement of disparate impact uh, allegations. So ultimately, this will find its way, they're hoping, into the court, the court that they've stacked. And so what they're hoping is ultimately that the Supreme Court will narrow the ability of the federal government to uh, pursue disparate impact cases. They've been after this for 50 years. Hell, they've been after it since they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And, and I really think, finally, that that's where we have to locate the beginning of this opposition. Just like the end of Reconstruction saw the redemption movement, and we, of course, you and I had a long conversation about Wilmington and other places like that. What we're seeing now is the kind of perhaps last move in a 50-year war against that second Reconstruction that William Barber and so many people are talking about. And the Civil Rights Act of 64 is absolutely part of the, civil, uh, the second Reconstruction. And so this attack is just one more attempt to take a jackhammer to those protections. Eight six six eight zero one eight two five five. Dr. Gray Carr in class with Carr on Saturdays at noon Eastern on YouTube live. You can uh, hear him mostly. I just ask questions. No, hear <laughs> us. Pre- I you know that problem. <laughs> listen, listen. Um, and and you know to say that we're in the in the midst of the Civil War that it was not one. Uh, it was not one with 13th, 14th, the 15th Amendment. And we we know that for a fact because that when they broke into Congress today. In the halls of Congress, they brought a Confederate flag with them. Did you see that? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Well, this is they crazy. claim the American flag, too. They're both red, white, and blue. They claim them all, which means that, in fact, what we're seeing, in fact, and this is interesting in the current, what we're seeing with these objections is probably the first formal act of the 2024 presidential election cycle. What these senators and Congress people are doing is auditioning. So Tom Cotton counted up the cost and said, hold on, I'm going to back up a little bit. But young Josh Hawley says, I want to get ahead of this thing. So let me let me make my stand. It's going to be interesting. Nikki Haley, talk about a flag. What's Nikki Haley going to say or not say? Because she's trying to keep her powder dry. But what they're doing is auditioning right now. Smiling Mike Pence, he's caught in literally a pincher movement. You know, you heard Trump today on the mall. He says, you know, I'm going to be real disappointed if Pence. Been, but, you know, Pence has been rescued. Why? The hillbilly horde came up in the Capitol, and now he gets whisked away, pimp out. <laughs> Meaning what? I don't have to. I didn't have to do it. I didn't have to do it. Everybody's trying to keep their powder dry and hold their breath past January 20. And meanwhile, the Democrats, and let's not lose sight of the things that we can invent. You know what? Send Merrick Garland. Let him be the Attorney General. That opens up a seat on the D.C. Court of Appeals. So that means our friends, whether it be our friend Sherilyn Eiffel in, 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 in the LACP Legal Defense Fund, our friend Kristen Clark over there at the Lawyers Committee, let's get this list. In fact, don't even give a list. Send the name through Senator, I mean, Vice President Harris. Put this black woman on the D.C. Court of Appeals and keep your left eye on Clarence Thomas. Because the minute he says, you know what, this diabetes finally got me. I'm a black man. I'm about to get out of here. You put that sister that you've elevated in the Merrick Garland seat on the United States Supreme Court. Hey, didn't you promise that, Joe? Didn't you promise that, Joe? Don't get caught up on Merrick Garland. He just left a seat open. And before the end of this month, we want them to stack, bruh. Run the check and uh, keep Joe Manchin in line because the seat of power just moved from Kentucky to West Virginia. 
Meaning what? You have a conversation with him today. Joe, I just want to see your thumb up all the time. And by May, we want the George Floyd Act. We want the, uh, the, the, the John Lewis Voting Act. We want the COVID relief because we're in the middle of a whole play. And we want a couple more two-stack checks. That's what's got to happen now. We can't get caught up in the personality thing. And treat losers like losers. Let's stop compromising no with question. people who don't deserve any compromise. No, no reaching, a, no, no conciliatory. And I'm not asking for contention. I'm just saying, if you won, act like a winner. 866-801-8255. That gets nothing. This is why uh, Senator Harris, uh, now Vice President Harris, much of the deep suspicion in black and brown communities about her was on her prosecutorial record as Attorney General of California. Here's your chance to step in and tell Joe Biden, you know what? You like Merrick Garland? I maybe disagree with you in private. Hopefully she did. But if she didn't, guess what? Tell the attorney general we need a criminal investigation of Trump because you're absolutely right. What good is the rule of law if anything goes? The man has broken the law unless there is no law. If that's what you're saying, then, uh, then fine. Let's just all go because guess what? Looking at the demographics here, and it's not going to end well for this experiment. Because it ain't never been a nation, and you've always mistreated people. And after we saw this white ride in D.C. over the counting of the vote, of the electoral college vote, what was very clear is that white people get treated differently. So what kind of message are you going to send? If you don't go after Donald Trump, what you're saying is that there is no – that there's some people don't – the law doesn't apply to them. And all that's going to do is embolden – make no mistake about it. This is just a brief. There's going to be a better Trump. We're going to see those candidates emerge in the next two, two years and then four years. Um, don't be surprised if Stacey Abrams, as you say, becomes the governor of Georgia, but she might not have to beat Brian Kemp. Why? Because we ain't seen the less of Doug Collins. Doug Collins probably going to primary Brian Kemp down there, and he's going to have to run against a real white supremacist. And uh, Senator Warnock is up for re-election in 24 months. What you got is a small window to draw a bright line, and part of that bright line must be if you want to have a country, and you're right. Get that money to Latosha and Cliff and them. Latosha and Cliff and them. Get that money to Black Voters Matter. Why? If you're going to have a country, you have to prove to us that we should buy in. Because when I hear Latosha, when I hear people say, you know, we, we, we got people out here, we're talking about America. I'm not talking about America. I'm talking about right and wrong. And guess what? Those people who voted, they didn't vote because they got America in their heart. They voted because they said there is right and there is wrong. Now, if you want that right and wrong tied to them stars and, and stripes, you better make it stand up and, 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 and fly. Because last I checked, you had a bunch of people with other types of red, white, and blue, and you ain't put nobody in jail. So you're telling me that this is all about power. But you should check, because we're the ones beginning to hold the power now. And we kind of like the taste. We kind of like the taste. So they, yeah, they better prosecute Trump, because what's on trial is America, not Donald Trump. 